I can hear everything clearly. Are you there? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, good. Pussy, hi. How are you doing, man? Good, well, good, how good. are you, Walter? Oh, I'm good, man. Awesome, man. Excellent. Fantastic. All Pussy, right. Hi. How are you doing, man? You good? Yeah, hi, John. I'm good, brother. <laughs> yeah, Jeff. Jeff, oh, wow. are you there? I'm here. Pleasure to meet you, Vusi and John, for the first time. Uh, Walter, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? I can. I can hear you fine. Great. Fantastic. All right. I think uh, we're going to kick, kick this off now. So, yeah, no, I think uh, thank you, gentlemen, for, for joining today. I think we've got an awesome uh, panel today, and I think everybody's quite excited. And looking forward to uh, you know chatting to you guys and just learning from you guys from your experience and and, and everything that uh, you guys have done you know so uh, just welcome to everyone and um, you know so I think one of the key things about today is very interestingly is that all the people uh, the panelists today are people that are involved in funding in venture capital IT. I've been in IT myself for almost 25 years. And, um, you know, these are people that have built their businesses on their own, have invested their own money, have made money, lost money. And, and so we're sitting on a wealth of experience, you know, bought and sold companies. And so I think today we, we are gleaning from some of the top leaders in the world and, and from their experience. And so... Uh, I think it's going to be exciting. So how we're going to do it is I'm, I'm going to ask a, a couple of questions and, um, you know, and, and then towards the end, we're going to allow people to, to ask questions as well and participate. So I want to ask you to please mute your mic if you can during this session uh, until it's time to ask questions. And when it's time to ask questions, I'm going to call your name and then you can unmute your mic and then ask you a question. And so you must tell us your name and what you do, what business you are in, and ask your question. And please try and ask your question within at least one minute, you know, because we've got a, a lot of people that also want to wanna ask questions, you know. I think one of the things that uh, people don't realize as far as venture capital is concerned is that a lot of people that sit with money, uh, one of their biggest challenges is looking for good opportunities. You know, that's that's one of the things that, that I think people don't realize is, is venture capitalists are looking for that for that one great, great opportunity, great product, uh, uh, you know, that, that just brings the, the, the highest return, you know. And, um, and so, you know, money actually is chasing good ideas. Now, I want to I wanna start with you, Vusi. I mean, we've got a cross-continental chat today, but I want to start in South Africa. Vusi, you've been running your firm for a while now. I want to just find out from you, you know, what is more important? I mean, is it, is it the idea that the person has? Is it the money uh, that they, they need? And, and how can the young entrepreneurs that we have today on this panel, uh, you know, participate in a space where their businesses can actually take off and begin to make a meaningful contribution? And please yeah, just feel free, to share, feel free to share what's on your on your heart. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Walter. I appreciate that. I, I uh, first, I I can't see myself, so I'm, I'm I'm assuming that if you're admin, you can try and help me with my camera because it is on. Um, so if you if you can help me with that, that'll be great. But yeah. All right, admin, admin, please look into that. But to you know to answer your question. I think that, um, so first, you know, the, in the world at the moment, there is more money than there are decent deals. So there is, there is a lot of opportunity out there. Um, right. and, and there is a lot of opportunity, particularly for people that are building great platforms or great businesses. The question you asked was very pointed, right? Because it was around what are the opportunities that are out there and what are people looking for? You know, the answer to that is actually very simple. I think the first is, you know, every fund has its own mandate. So you really want to make sure that when you're approaching funders, you're talking to funds to what you are looking for. 
right? So you want to make sure that you're talking to funds that in whose mandate is to fund you. So for instance, if you are a technology play, there's no point talking to an agriculture fund. They wouldn't fund an agri an ag a technology business. Similarly, if you're an agribusiness, don't talk to a technology company or a technology funder. The second is funders look for great management teams because at the end of the day, you're not funding the business or the platform or, or the market opportunity. You're actually funding the, the management team that's driving it. The third is a strong technical competence. So you really are looking for people who are technically competent at whatever it is that the, the, the business is going to be doing, whatever it is that the platform is going to be. All right, I think we've lost, uh, we've lost Lucy there. And we lost Lucy. Um, I think the admin just checked there in terms of the video as well, uh, just to make sure that we can get Lucy. There, there we go. All right, there, there we go. go. All right, awesome, good. <laughs> Awesome. So, All right. so, you know, so I was saying that, you know, just as a final note that I think um, everybody really wants to be part of, of, of something that makes a difference. Every single funder you talk to, by the way, we're all driven fundamentally by the need to leave an imprint in the world, right? So you'll find that there's, there's a strong drive to be a part of something that's going to have a positive impact, whether you call it venture funding or seeds funding or um, impact investing, everybody wants to become part of something that's going to leave the world a better place than they found it. Mm -hmm. And my advice to every entrepreneur out there is always make sure that in your pitch, you're very clear about why the thing you're doing is going to leave the ecosystem you're in or the industry you're in or the country you're in or the environment you're in better than you found it before. Um, so those are kind of, you know, very broadly, but those are kind of the things that funders look for. Now notice, I haven't, I haven't mentioned financial return. I haven't spoken about, you know, yeah, IRR. Yeah, yeah. I haven't spoken about right. capital gains. Because if you don't right. pass those initial steps, then the financial returns actually cease to matter. Right, right. That's fantastic. And I think a lot of the, the entrepreneurs, the young entrepreneurs don't always understand that, that it's not about uh, uh, you know, the money, it's not about the profit, it's about the motive. If, if you can solve a problem, you're likely to make more money than anybody's ever made. So you, you got to focus on the need, right? You got to focus on the problem and everything else kind of, kind of follows that. So, so that, that's, that's very powerful. Jeff, Jeff, you've been running venture capital now for also a number of years. You've, you've sold companies. I know one of your businesses was sold for 6 billion rand another one for, for like 4 billion rand. And you've been buying and selling companies, um, I mean, uh, for a good part of your life. Now, uh, I, I want to ask you the same question. You know, what are, what are your thoughts on that? You know, uh, you know, just for the entrepreneurs that are saying, okay, listen, I, I, I've got an idea or I've started. And, you know, how do they match with what you're looking for? Well, uh, Lucy had an excellent point, which is, you know, to make sure you're talking to the right people that are aligned with what you're trying to do. And it's, and it's, I think it's even more specialized today than ever before, because it's not just enough to be talking to a technology fund. If you're a tech company, you have to be talking to either a startup tech fund or a growth equity tech fund or a private equity tech fund. There's, there's different levels of growth. I, you know, what I do today is I, I'm growth equity. We won't touch anything unless it's at least 10 million US. And so if you just have an right. idea, you shouldn't be talking to me. <laughs> you should be talking to somebody yeah. that's in the yeah. pure venture business. And, but, but I think if you're, if you're a young entrepreneur at the, at the venture end of the spectrum, uh, the, the, I want to expand on something Lucy said, which is to leave the world in a better place. Fundamentally, whatever you're going to do in your new venture, it has to make the world better. It has to make whatever your product or service is, it has to be faster, cheaper, better than what's out there today. Otherwise, it's not going to get any trans traction. A common mistake I see uh, people who start in a new business is they, saw, they solve a problem that they think is important. And, and it's a problem that's important to them, but it's not necessarily a problem that businesses want to spend money to solve. There's a lot of problems in the world that businesses tolerate, 
and they say, ah, that's not my top 10, I'm not gonna spend money on that. Make sure whatever you're gonna do, that it's something that customers will give you money to solve for them. Proof of demand is the most important step that I see entrepreneurs uh, forget to make certain of before they launch their business. Does that make sense? Wow, that's awesome. That, that's very deep. That's very powerful. Okay, so, so don't just focus on, on what's important to you. Find out what the people actually want and that can make a difference. In, yeah, that, that's amazing. The proof of demand, you say. Okay, that, that's cool. John, can you step in there? Sure. Uh, you know, your, your experience in, in, in this space, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and I, look, I, I think that Vusi and Jeff have mentioned quite a few things that are quite fundamental, right? And and I'm going to give you an example uh, of a fund that actually decided to get out of Africa. Uh, I think it's a Carlyle Ventures Fund, an American chap who actually established yeah. himself just about 10 years ago to be able to help African businesses to get funding. But what did we see? That, you know what, because the perception that most African venture or project or entrepreneurs are more about asking for money as opposed to providing the actual real value. So this particular fund, uh, fund uh, found itself uh, 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 losing money uh, as opposed to making money for its investors. And, and I think that's the fundamental aspect that we see today, right? So when I speak to entrepreneurs, and I think Jeff has just alluded to, to that earlier on, uh, we, we live in a world that is, that is interconnected and, and I think that the internet reduces the distance between cities, between countries and between many geographics, right? So if you are building today and you're attracting capital, we all know that right now uh, uh, for tech-based companies, most businesses around the world, I mean, uh, the, 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 Asia, the Asian market or the European market or the American market, these are, these are the guys who get the money to be able to uh, to invest in, in, in tech-based companies and so forth. We found it very hard, very difficult in South Africa, but also in other African regions to be able to attract those kind of capital. So when we see Carl Lill coming in in Africa and say, you know what, I'm going to focus on helping entrepreneurs to be able to grow, but these entrepreneurs are not able to show the real value behind their project. They're, they're, they're not bankable project, they're not bankable solution and in fact they're only focusing more on on solving problems around communities they're all about asking for money as opposed to seeing exactly okay i'm asking for money possibly for a seed capital or on a growth stage but i'm really looking to make an impact and ultimately uh, this will be able to, to to provide great returns for the investors out there right so if we don't see that you will actually see an influx of money running away from you as opposed to coming to you so uh, what we have done as CryptoVex Capital over the last four or five years is we saw an opportunity, especially for, block, uh, 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 for, for tech-based companies, we saw an opportunity to establish ourselves in the blockchain space. And, that, and that's my space, and I love it very much, and I can talk about it for, for <laughs> all year long. And what I found really sexy about that is the following. As opposed to Silicon Valley, uh, whereby venture capital firms like Jeff will only be able to attract a growth entrepreneur or a growth company that is not less than $10 million and up. It's very difficult to find these companies in Africa, let alone South Africa where I live, right? It's very hard. But even if, even if it was, even if my business was generating that kind of return on a yearly basis, the chances for me to find an investor in this particular region that can actually pour that kind of money is really, really hard. Now, we see companies like Uber, we see companies like Facebook and Zoom. Zoom, by the way, who's, who's done a tremendous amount of return since the beginning of the year. We see these people being able to find capital out of Silicon Valley, a place that I love, and I've been to, to these places. I've been to Facebook and Google. I've seen, it's quite amazing. So why is it that the guys, the entrepreneurs in those regions can attract the capital as easily as possible, as opposed to the folks in South Africa or in other regions of Africa, right? It's really, really hard. So the mindset there is quite, is quite different. So we, we, we see a combination of business people 
in the US who understand the value of tech as opposed to the African folks who realize tech is important but may not necessarily understand the value of tech until really you really explain to them what is what is what this is all about. So what we do in the blockchain space is the following. We we, we break down the, the, the barriers of entry. I mean, Jeff, you would know that the SEC uh, forbids any non-accredited investor to be able to engage in a venture's fund, whereby $100,000 is the minimum. Uh, this is roughly about 2 million rand. How many people in South Africa or in Africa have got 2 million rand lying around for them to be able to contribute or participate in an investment opportunity? Or for them to be able to engage with my growth fund or plum tree uh, uh, partners uh, to say, hey, you know what, Vusi, here's my 10 million rand. I'm just a nobody out there or I'm, I'm somebody from the street. I'm, I'm looking and I know your fund is, is generate, has generated a thousand X over the last three years. And I would really love to have the opportunity to be a part of that. How many people, how many entrepreneurs are able to provide those kind of those or are able to have access to those, to those kind of opportunities? And, yeah. and what we find that the blockchain allows us to do is, first of all, to break down those barriers. Right. So we're able to to structure still in a traditional venture capital uh, 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 firm and allowing us to tap into the blockchain space and allowing people, anybody, to be able to become a participant in this, in this ecosystem. So we've done that for the last uh, three and a half years, and that's exactly what we thrive on. And uh, we simply take on the best practices of, venture, of traditional venture capital firm, and we're blending the aspect of blockchain technology for us to be able to stimulate the economy and create a new ecosystem of entrepreneurs that can certainly have access to this funding and for us to help them achieve their goals. So um, I, look, Right. Sometimes it's, right. it's a little bit of balance between the two, but certainly as we go on, I'll, I'll be yeah. able to give, to give you more light on okay. that. No, thank you. Thank you, John. And, and uh, I think the, the, the crypto space is, a, is an important emerging uh, space. And, and, you know, I think uh, a lot of people are still trying to assess uh, uh, and understand. And you, you're one of the people that's leading that. And I think it's important that, you, you know, the training that you're giving. Uh, around the world to, to educate people. So, you know, one of the things that, that I find is that people don't always understand that money follows great ideas, whether they're startups, and I mean, in the venture capital space, there are different levels uh, at which venture capital comes in, whether it's, it's, uh, it's at startup phase or growth stage or the late, late growth stage. And I think, Jeff, you alluded to the fact that you, you only look at more either the growth or late growth, growth stage. So you you need to have progressed with your idea to a certain level, you know, but one of the interesting things, there's two questions I want to ask you guys is, you know, there's a mindset that's out there and I've found it. I've been running my own fund now for the last 10 years, uh, you know, that when people come looking for money, they tend to complain about, you know, the bar that you set in order to, to actually invest because they feel like you actually take in more than you should. And they, they seem to want to compare uh, the deal to a bank, for instance, which, which would uh, perhaps charge uh, a much lower interest rates and, and maybe, uh, uh, you know, uh, and so on. And, or, or, the, or the government. But what, what they don't seem to realize is the, the risk appetite is, is very different. You know, a bank is going to take some collateral, is going to make sure they take your house, your dog, your car, and everything else. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, and, and venture capitalists and funders take, take risk. They, they look more at the individuals behind. If it fails, how am I going to get my money back type of thing? So the first question is, how do we, do you guys get to deal with this perception uh, you know, where people feel like, first of all, your money is too expensive. And number two, that there's a feeling of entitlement. And I don't know, Jeff, if you've seen that, but there's a sense of entitlement. Like, you know what, you know, I, I'm entitled to this money, you know. <laughs> so, you know, how do you guys deal with that? Yeah, Bussy. <laughs> is that for Bussy or for You're me? Laughing, so. <laughs> okay, so look, uh, 
you know, I was. Okay, I used Jim, to go ahead. I, I used to be a banker at Citibank in my early days. So I got really practiced at saying no to customers. And you're right. We don't want to, <laughs> we don't want to say no to customers. We want to say yes, but it's, it's hard yeah. because there's always this surplus of people that want money, but aren't ready for it. And you know, the, the simplest cat, most callous way I can say it is look, investors, they, they want to make money. They want to invest in the best ideas and like, yeah. you know, our fund institutional investors give us capital. They, they expect us to earn three times whatever money they give us. Then from yeah. that profit, we pay ourselves and then we return to them two times. That's the model. There's nothing. It's pretty simple math. And so when you come to us at looking for our money, we want to, be able to see our ways that we can go to work with you and help build your company. And then we can exit in about five years time and earn three times our investment. And you might say that's right. expensive capital. It is, but we're also pretty good at building companies. We know how to do it. We built one company after another and we do have a playbook and, and we, we don't, we're not successful every single time. Sometimes we fail. And we have to pay for our failures with our successes. And, you know, but that's, that's the reality is investors want to make money and you have to earn the money. And once you start earning investors money, they will shower you with capital. They will give you more money right. than you ever dreamed of. Once you start making them money. Right. right. So, so, so what you're saying is, is, you know, Entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs need to assess the level that they're at, and and sometimes you you don't you don't have the power to demand what you want. You are told what you're supposed to get until you get to a point where your business has got enough muscle to be able to speak up and say, you know what, if you don't give me this, I'm going elsewhere because you know you're at that point where you can actually uh, demand something. But I think. The, 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 the great thing is that, you know, what you're saying is you're bringing not just money, you're bringing uh, expertise and experience and all of that that's meant to help the business to take off and, and, and begin to make a difference in the market. Right. I'll be the first to tell you, if you're trying to build the blockchain business, you need to go take capital from John, not from me, because <laughs> he can actually help right. you build that business. I can't. I'm not going to be good right. at blockchain. I have my specialties, too. Now, can I just jump in right. here? Because I do think that there is, um, you know, this pricing for me is a conversation absent of value. So anytime I start hearing entrepreneurs talk about the pricing of a particular term sheet, I know that we're now having a, at the end of the day, a dollar is a dollar, right? You get it from me, you get it from Sheikh Bihram. It's a dollar. It doesn't really matter. But there's a reason you're talking to me. And the reason is because there is an embedded value in my investing in your business that you're not going to get if you're getting a dollar from somebody who is perhaps in an industry that is unrelated, um, who, is a, who is not a fay with your territory, who doesn't understand the local nuance, all of those things. So when entrepreneurs for me say, you know, the terms of the money are a bit expensive, I think they forget three very fundamental things. First, at growth equity, which is the stage we work at, the level of risk I'm taking is very different to putting my money into a mature business because of the information asymmetry. It's even worse. I could just take that money and put it in the money markets or the yeah. you know, traditional asset class and I would earn percentage points without, with zero effort and zero costs attached. So the fact that I'm putting it in means that there is a cost factor and there is a, and this is important for entrepreneurs to remember, there is a heavy lifting I am going to do that by the way, I don't have to do. I can just take my money and put it somewhere else. So, right. so I think it's very important for entrepreneurs to remember that it's a value conversation. It's not a price conversation. You know, for me, rather than say to me, your money's too expensive, ask me, you know, what, what comes with the money? Can you help me build market share? Can you help me build an ecosystem of partners and relationships? Can you help me accelerate the technology? Can you, you know, what else comes with the money? Um, and I think any time I've ever invested in the business where my money was all that was what was on the line, uh, we've never made a return because 
you know, it's the, the relationship, the relationship just doesn't work then. And I think you'll find that as a universal theme across for all investors, it's not just money, it's money as a, as a, as an access point, but certainly money, I would say is 20% of what we do. The other 80% is networks, right. relationship, right. mentorship. Right. It's, right. you know, putting a board in place, risk, governance, compliance. That's really the stuff that you need. That's the stuff that's going to help you grow. I have seen more businesses die because of risk, governance, and compliance than because of liquidity. Usually liquidity is an outcome of poor risk, poor governance, and poor compliance, right? So the reason you're actually bringing me in is because you want to build those systems and you don't know how, and nor do you have the time to build that stuff. You want somebody that's going to help you build that stuff. Sure. Fantastic. Look, uh, from my perspective, I, I, I can add on to what Jeff and Vusi has have mentioned, and I think it's, it's quite important points right there. What I often tell entrepreneurs, and I've been there myself, I've been, I've been in this space for the last 13 years, and uh, I, I know what it means to be an entrepreneur. I know, I know the hardship we actually go through. I know how hard it is to even identify capital for funding our own project. But my own experience tells me that before I can actually go out there and ask for money, I need to make sure that I've built my foundation, I've built my, my, my basis to reach a level whereby I don't necessarily need money, but then I can find a Jeff and a Vusi to fight over me so they can actually invest in me. That's the hardest part. And to make that happen, a lot of people need to be able to understand what it means to building a business. Who do you need on your team? Do you have the drive and the passion to succeed? Because if you have that passion and you love exactly what you do, and for me, if you're thinking as well that entrepreneurship is not a job, but a call, a calling or a mission that, that you have to fulfill, whereby during the hard times, you know that your passion and the love for what you do will always lift you up because you will always remember the end goal, which is about building what I started, remembering exactly the reasons why you started. You will then reach a point whereby over, you know, it will take you about 18 months to three years, sweat equity and your own resources, building value into your business so that you can reach a point whereby Vusi and Jeff can come in in your business and say, you know what, we'd love to actually help you out. We'd love to, to help you grow. We'd love to take you from where you are into another level. Why? They're sitting on piles of money and they're having the pressure from their investors who are looking for them to make, to make them big returns, right? Otherwise, if they are unable to do that, their investors could actually pull out their capital and say, you know what? Uh, 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 I'd rather, just like was mentioned, I'd rather take my money and put it into a traditional asset class. I'd rather take my money and put... So based on the fact that entrepreneurs need to understand the mandate of each one of these venture capital firms, they also need to be able to allow themselves and say, you know what? Let me build up value and then reach a point whereby Vusi will see that I have enough value and he can say, okay, because you've done so much over the last three years, I'm willing to bet on you 5 million rand or 10 million rand. And he knows, he knows very well that when he's making that, 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 uh, that assessment, he's, he's gone through the, the due diligence. He's gone through the value chain, understanding exactly what you've done. And based on his, his, his risk appetite and what he's able to do, he said, okay, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll put my money into your business because perhaps in the next three years, that particular business is going to make him a hundred X, right? But from my yeah. perspective, I All think right. we're looking into is, is a little bit different because if we, if we, especially from an African perspective, and, and, and I've been here for 18 years in this country and I know exactly how hard it is. I know that the government is trying to, uh, to put so many, so many policies in place and, you know, the triple B is there and, and quite a few entrepreneurs who are doing quite a few things. And, but still, after 18 years of being in this country, still entrepreneurs are having a hard time. Entrepreneurs can't still find money or perhaps access to valuable lessons for them to understand what it means to build a business from the ground up, for them to understand what it means to put the board together. For them to realize, hey, it's not just about your passion. It's not just about 
about what you want to achieve. But if you want to take your business from point A to point B, whereby you could potentially be listed at a GSE, these are the things that you need to be able to do, right? So not many businesses in SA have the opportunity to find mentors or other successful entrepreneurs that can lead them all the way to get there. And I should thank uh, uh, and congratulate Vusi for being able to hold these master classes and so forth. And I know, and I, I've been watching some of the things that you do, uh, encouraging and empowering these entrepreneurs to learn the fundamentals of being able to build, to build a business. Well, we come in as a venture firm, focusing on alternative investment opportunities, is to see, hey, you know what? For you to get access to capital, not only do we also go through the traditional, you know, uh, uh, venture capital shit where we have to review the team, the expertise, the market, and so forth, but we're building other models that would allow us to be able to avail the capital to these entrepreneurs. And that's exactly the space that I'm actually uh, working in. Uh, it, it doesn't have, I don't have to work with a company or, or uh, uh, entrepreneurs who are building blockchain-based companies, but we just leverage this platform for us to be able to create a new ecosystem of entrepreneurs that can ultimately support these businesses for them to be able to go into a growth phase. So ultimately, and, and Busi added a, a very important point. It's about the network. When you're working with me, you have access to my network. And, and, and that network has, hasn't been built overnight. So we, we spent years building that particular network, network of, of investors, of lawyers, of, of compliance officers, of bankers around the world. And, and, and all of that come as a package to you. But we need to also assess what the opportunities are and for us to decide whether our risk appetite would allow us to go into that. So we've got multiple different uh, fund structure and, under, under our main right. umbrella. And we look for opportunities to invest into, into entrepreneurs. Right. Right. Now, one of the things that I think I've, I've learned over the last 25 years in, in business is, is the value of partnerships, right? Now, a venture capitalist is a partner. And, and like you rightly said, John, the, the value that comes is more than, and Busi, you mentioned, is more than just money, you know. And, and I always say, I mean, look at the, the Fortune 500 companies and some of, even look at the top 20 companies that are, are leading uh, worldwide. The founders themselves right now have a much smaller equity than they started off with. You know, they probably have maybe 10 or 15% of the company. But that okay. 15, 10 or 15% is worth a couple of billion US dollars, all right? Why? What happened? Along the way, they had to bring in strategic partners that added value to a point where they could grow because not no one new human being has, has got it all. And I think that's the mindset that I feel a lot of uh, uh, younger entrepreneurs lack. They, they want to own everything and hold on to everything, you know, and yet they've got nothing. You know, they, they, they've got an idea or, you know, they started off and they need more capital so they can pay the bills and yet they're demanding everything. So, I think that's a mentality that's going to fall off. If, if I believe in your idea, then I want to come in there and tell you, okay, this is what I want for that. And you've got to be flexible enough at that stage to be willing to let me invest until you get to a point where, the, where, where you can buy me out and, and, and you know, or, or, um, or, or bring in a, a different investor. So I think there's a mindset shift that needs to take place for, for a lot of our people to begin to participate more because a lot of great dreams die in infancy simply because of, of, of selfishness. You know, I, I, you know, I, I mean, uh, I, one of my biggest projects that, that I did in South Africa I, I was about 3 billion rand and I had to give away 50% in order to do a turnover of 3 billion. Now think about it. You have to give away 50%, but you know what? After that, I didn't have to give away as much because there's always another project at the end of the line. So the project that you have today is not your last project. You, there's other projects that, that are still going to come. So don't be selfish and hang on to money that, uh, that you don't have. So, so that's interesting. Now, another question that I have is, uh, you know, we've got a lot of young, a uh, young uh, entrepreneurs today. I mean, Jeff, in, a, in, a, in, in the U.S., I mean, there's these young tech guys that are coming up, man, and they're disrupting everything. They're just shifting uh, the ball game, you know, and, and the old folk are looking and saying, wow, what's going on here, you know? 
Um, what's your take on, on the kind of the space that we're in globally in terms of innovation and, uh, you know, disruptive uh, companies? And, and what's the value of, of market research and, and relevance, you know, uh, in terms of the future and where the world, world is going? Right now, the whole world is affected with, by this COVID-19. You know, but yet in the midst of this, there's other companies that have doubled or tripled their revenue. You know, so how how do we uh, move forward in this in this kind of environment? And as we come out of this COVID-19, which, by the way, I think is going to be here at least for another two or three years. So there's a whole shift in terms of how we do business that has to take place. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? Uh, so the shift that is happening is COVID-19 is going to be around for a while, you know, so get used to it. Quit waiting for things to get back to normal. This is the new normal. Um, there will be more digital video conferencing like this. There will be more work from home. There will be more uh, cybersecurity. There will be more cryptocurrency. There will be, you know, more touchless ways to pay. And so I think that there will be more AI, there will be more machine learning, there will be more, the trends that were already in motion have gotten a gentle push by COVID-19 and they're accelerating. Um, that means, but there's also some industries that have been devastated by it, like travel, restaurants, right? Uh, and so I think as a young entrepreneur, I would encourage you to shift your try to shift your business either into growing markets that are performing well during this crisis or serving customers that are performing well during this, this crisis. Uh, and there's going to be, uh, you know, innovation is alive and well. There's always a younger generation of college graduates. And by the way, they're coming from all over the world. One of the, the benefits I had in my life is to have 55,000 employees all over planet Earth, in Africa, in Asia, in India, in the islands, in South America, Central America, Europe. There's smart people everywhere, brilliantly smart, talented people coming up. And the ideas the kids are thinking of just always blow me away. Uh, so I, I don't think we're going to have any shortage of innovation. And it's just, you know, it's just the challenge is all of this change. There is a price of change, right? <laughs> change is great for those that are making change happen. Things change is not so great for those that it happens to. And uh, and that's just that's that's the nature of business that there's always going to be change. So I think the companies that can adapt to changing circumstances will be su more successful. In fact, that's one of the core skill sets we look for in our CEOs. Are they adaptable? Are they willing to say, wait a minute, there's new information and I was wrong. <laughs> Can I change my attitudes and my opinions right. based upon new information? It's a very hard thing for human beings to do. Hard for me to do, hard for right. all of us. Right, 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 right. Okay, Bruce, all right, you, just to just to add in that, uh, Walter. Uh, okay, I, John, yeah. I, 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 th I think that, you know, it's true that the COVID-19 situation has kind of dis disrupted, disrupted everything, right? Um, and, and, and I remember the last time, I, well, when I was at Bruce's office, uh, I think it was on the 2nd of March, uh, he and I had a conversation uh, uh, discussing quite a few things that I do in the blockchain space, and then I had to, to travel. And you know, Walter, that uh, a lot of the things that I do uh, requires me to travel a lot. Uh, so every, every third week, I'm, I'm out of the country and, and, and in a different time zone. Um, but, but luckily I have, I had to come back and, and be in lockdown in my, in, in, you know, in, in my place of residence. And, uh, that forced me to, to accelerate even, even more, um, uh, the things that we, we, we are already doing in this particular space. Right. So, and the one thing that I've been doing, especially during the first 21 days lockdown was to engage with a lot of entrepreneurs out there and, and encouraging them to identify new ways um for them to to still be engaging with their customers um if assume for example you are a consulting firm and 
and um, a lot of the things that you do requires you to be on a face-to-face -face basis with your clients. Um, see exactly how you could adapt. Um, if your business model could, could transition from just being a traditional face-to-face -face and packaging your, your entire product or service uh, to be offered uh, uh, as a digital content, for example, uh, I, I think that's certainly something that entrepreneurs should be able to do. So uh, being agile is, is exactly what we're all about, it's, you know, for us entrepreneurs. Um, we, we shouldn't just be uh, uh, sticking behind and say, hey, you know what, COVID-19 is here and there's nothing I can do. You got to be able to maneuver around. You got to be able to find ways uh, to do things remotely. And uh, whether it is through Zoom or Microsoft uh, Teams or Skype or anything, uh, see exactly how you can apply this. So many things we've been talking about the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, the COVID-19 has kind of accelerated that. So we need to be able to accept this particular new normal and make that part of our, 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 our daily lives. I certainly do believe that many companies out there will have to review their policies when it comes to working from home as well. A lot of people will, will have to be allowed to work from home, uh, but there are certainly businesses that cannot necessarily adapt or, or it will be difficult for them to adapt depending on the industry. Um, for example, the event industry, um, many of my customers are in the event business. They're affected, but they still are able to use our digital tools. Uh, but unfortunately, they can't host these shows where hundreds of people can actually gather. And guess what? Because of that, they cannot make a single income. And many of them have been able to, to pivot around. Uh, uh, for example, using, using their, their manufacturing plant for them to, instead of building stand shows, uh, I mean, show stands, they'll be helping the government to build, um, I would say, um, office compliant, COVID-19 office compliant uh, uh, office desks, for example. That's the market opportunity for you. Uh, some of them could actually say, you know what, let's use our design capabilities for us to do certain things online. I've seen some of my clients uh, providing mobile hospital beds to government locally here. So everybody has to be to be to be agile and shift. You you you, you just can't be hit by this pandemic. You got to figure out a way uh, to maneuver around, and internet allows you to do just that today. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. We see. Yeah, I just wanted to add. There's an Isaac on the chat who asked a question about needing a mentor, and I think. You know, I like it when entrepreneurs talk about needing a mentor, but I always say to entrepreneurs, a mentor-mentee relationship is a very deep connection. Yeah. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs simply want to mentor so that they have the deferral of responsibility. Um, I'm going to tell you for free, by the way, that you're not going to get that if you get a mentor with, with their weight. So, so my recommendation to entrepreneurs looking for a mentor is to answer first the question, why, then what? So why do you think you need a mentor? What's the problem that needs solving? Are you in an environment where you have problems that you don't have answers to? Um, or are you needing, you know, so, so I'll give you an example. We just put a board in place for our firm. Now I put a board in place and rather than a mentor because the things we're doing require that I have a fiduciary board as opposed to a mentor who's going to help me with a different part of you know, my personal development. So I always just think it's really important to make sure that if you're asking for a mentor, make sure you know why. Make sure you understand exactly what the deficiency is that you're trying to solve for so that you can also be judicious about the person to whom you're approaching to be your mentor. There's nothing worse than me. I mean, I get this. I'm sure it's the same for Jeff and John, but I get probably about 100 emails in a month of people saying, please mentor me. Actually, what they're really saying is, can I please defer the, re the responsibility of my personal growth to you? Tell me what I should do. Tell me what next is. Tell me where to go. And no mentor worth their weight is going to do that because they have their own things going on. So it's really important that you're clear and clinical about the what that you need and why you need it. Absolutely. Fantastic. fantastic. No, absolutely. And I think one of the things that's going to be uh, really challenging for, for companies right now is, uh, you know, people, CEOs always want to know that their people are sitting over there. 
and they can walk over to, to that desk and, you know, get what they want to be done and so on. And now, you know, that's not going to be possible, likely. So there's a whole reorganization of how an organization uh, functions and, and roles and responsibilities change. Uh, systems change, processes change, and, you know, the end product also changes and how that product is delivered to the client changes. So I think there's a lot of uh, uh, mindset shift that, that's going to have to take place for for businesses to really survive and, and succeed, uh, you know, in, in, in the future. I was talking to uh, Wendy yesterday, also a, a business lady in the U.S. Uh, yesterday, on, on, on the show and, and she's talking about hundreds and thousands of businesses that have gone up a business during this phase and they just have not been able to adapt uh, quickly enough. So I think my, my question, uh, and, and I see there's a couple of questions coming in from individuals is, you know, how, what's the, the value of being able to adapt and being flexible? Um, you know, to uh, and adopting your, your processes, the things that you hold so dear, you know, you've always done it this way and it's always worked and that's how you've made your money. But suddenly you like a guy that's swimming and drowning and, you know, uh, what's the value of adopting to the new, to the new world order that we have, a new, a new decade that we're entering in? Yeah, anybody? Sorry, Walter, uh, do you mind repeating your question, please? I don't think I heard your question very well. I'm, I'm saying that, you know, there's a lot of ad adapting that has to take place, you know, and, and there are companies, guys that are listening here and saying, okay, you know, how do I adapt to this new world order? You know, I mean, uh, things are changing all around me. I don't know if I should wait until the COVID is over and just go back to the way I did things, uh, you know, so maybe in a couple of months, everything's going to go back to normal, um, you know, so let me just wait and maybe just fund fund the next six months from my savings, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and then after six months, things, things have changed. Uh, or should I change the way my business operates and, and you know, in light of the, the changes that are, that are taking place? what I would call a new world order, really, and, and a new decade. Look, first of all, there's, there's no one strategy fits all scenarios or all situation. I, I think for, for, I would definitely be against the entrepreneur who says I should sit down and wait for the COVID-19 and, and figure out exactly what to do next. No, that, that would be, that would be, um, uh, that, that wouldn't be a wise idea, a wise approach. I, would, I definitely encourage entrepreneurs out there uh, to review with their peers, or if, if they do have a mentor, great with a mentor, but to review their business model. Uh, what is it that they currently are offering as a service that has been tremendously affected? And how can they uh, pivot around that and offering new services or even identify new uh, lines of business? Uh, you, you can't leave off your savings forever. And uh, if, if Assume, for example, that you've saved for about three, six months or just about 12 months. Uh, that's going to dry up. You need to figure out a way for you to create new business opportunities, uh, figure out a way for you to embrace technology and how can that piece of technology can be up, uh, applied in your business uh, and so forth. So I definitely encourage entrepreneurs um, to, to engage, to figure out, to pivot to determine exactly, I, I don't think there is a, there is a one strategy if it's all. Uh, I think as we normally engage with entrepreneurs as part of our mentorship uh, uh, programs, we, we kind of have a conversation and, and, and that's what Goose mentioned earlier, that relationship between an entrepreneur and a, uh, sorry, a, men, a mentor and a mentee is quite deep. That uh, irrespective of whether you two are in the same industry and perhaps doing the same thing, but the kind of advice I'd give to one is totally different than the one I'll give to the other. Uh, why? Because of their ability to adjust or their ability to comprehend or their ability to, to just run the business. So uh, I, I definitely encourage everybody uh, to figure out what it is they can just adjust in the business right now to tackle the, the post-COVID uh, situation. They shouldn't wait. They should use this moment. If they have to learn new skills, they should learn new skills uh, so they can actually generate new, 
new lines of income. Uh, uh, but I mean, to just remain still, nobody knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Nobody knows what's going to happen in six months. Uh, there are relief packages being distributed, you know, but in the U.S., two, over two trillion dollars has been printed so far as part of quantitative easing. And in South Africa, there is a um, 500 billion rand package that has been done. And many entrepreneurs reach out to me and say, hey, John, there's a 200 billion rand out there. How, what do we do for us to get access to that particular package? Well, there are many, uh, many things around it. Uh, but, but I do believe that, um, uh, you know, depending on how the government decides to structure that, it could be a great opportunity, to, opportunity here to, uh, to help the SMEs and the young entrepreneurs. But all of these entrepreneurs need to bring forth ideas or businesses uh, that ultimately will, will, will challenge the status quo in the you know, post-COVID post, post -COVID situation. So always pivot, never, never be, yeah. be still. Yeah, that's my take. Right, 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 right. So I think, I, I think each entrepreneur here, you, you know, your mind is your greatest asset, right? So, so you got to think, you know, you got to get up and start thinking, have moments where you spend, you know, especially if you're in lockdown, you're in the house, spend two hours thinking and, and strategizing, looking at all angles and trying to figure out how do you do it better or, or faster or, or whichever way. And, and also, uh, if you need to exit a particular market, you know, and, and, and just get out. And, you know, if you feel it's not going to work, just get out completely. Uh, there's nothing wrong in starting over and starting in a in a totally new market. At least you don't get to incur as as much cost as as you would if if you waited, and uh, then you you lose all your savings and so on. So I think it's really uh, you know the world that we are in, the decade that we're entering, is about mental might more than anything. You know, a lot of systems and processes are falling away. It's the great thinkers that are going to survive. You know, and you got to think out of the box, think beyond just what others have said and begin a pioneer. And these are the kind of entrepreneurs that are going to survive and embrace technology because technology is the future. You know, there's no way we're going back. You know, I'm amazed every day about different types of uh, technology that's out there that actually make my life easier, even stuff that I was doing if I'm writing a book or whatever it is that make my life so much easier than how it's been done before. So, so I, I would encourage folks to, to, you know, find out what's happening, study this new world that we're in and, and get on the bandwagon, you know, and, uh, and don't be left behind. Yeah. Yeah. Can I add now, two things, I'm, Walter? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Two things. Number one, survive the recession. Get your cost in line with whatever your new demand situation is. Survive the recession. Number two, adapt your management style. We have to manage differently. Tech companies have always been good working remotely and in more of a virtual environment. A lot of businesses never did that before. Manage differently. And the, and the, the word of management in this environment is over-communicate. You cannot over communicate with your employees, with your customers, with right. your prospects. Be just right. do more of it. Anytime you're sitting around wondering what to do next, talk to your people, talk to a customer. Be in front of people. Right. Communicate. Right, right. That's brilliant. Yeah. I, I think that's yeah, by the way, Jeff, and I just wrote that down. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Because most people want to run away, right? They want to shy away. They don't know what to do. They want to run away. They don't have answers to, uh, uh, to their creditors. You know, they can't pay the bills. And so they switch off their phones and, 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 you know, they hope something changes. But I think, you know, it's that engagement that helps, you know, and trying to, because everybody's going through the same thing, whether it's a landlord of a building that, that you know, you are using for, for, for the business. Or, or it's uh, payments to a finance institution for whatever it is. So, uh, you know, communication is the key because everybody's going through exactly the same thing. They're trying to figure out how they pay their own uh, creditors as well. So, um, so I think that's, that's a mega point. That's a big one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, there's one point I want to mention. There's, I've, I've seen a question and perhaps uh, a couple of questions here whereby 
Uh, some folks saying, you know what, I've got this brilliant idea. I would like to get started and I don't have money to raise. I, I often get that question, right? So what I mentioned to people is this. Uh, honestly, money is just an idea. Money, money is pretty much just an idea. And raising money is not the problem. The problem I find oftentimes is the entrepreneur who's trying to put together his business uh, for him to go out there and raising capital. Right. So we, we, we tend to be so focused on, wow, OK, so I've got this thing that I want to do, but um, uh, I'm scared to go into the bank or uh, I'm scared to 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 asking uh, Vusi who may not be able to fund my particular project or anybody else. So, guys, money for me is just an idea. If you've got a great idea and you structure your idea accordingly, raising capital is going to be extremely easy. And, and, and for me. The, the bank, especially when you're starting out, the bank is the last, the last place you want to go and, 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 and start raising your money. Uh, money is all around you. Now, but how do you, how do you get access to that money? A lot of people come to me and say, hey, John, can you please give me 20,000 Rand? I have this and this and this to do, to raise. Uh, 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 the question is, what value do you, have you got to offer me? Why should I take my... 50,000 Rand or 20,000 Rand and give you just for your proof of concept. So we need to be able to build a value chain on both sides. So let's say I've got 100,000 Rand and you've just got an idea, but you structure your idea in such a way that you could attract easily the 100,000 Rand from me, even if it was an independent raise, I'd be very happy to do an exchange because at that time, think about it this way. Money has got no value until it is used. If it stays in your bank account, it has absolutely no value until you actually take that money for you to exchange with something else. And that thing could be somebody else's idea, which, which is on top of a specific project that he wants to build, right? So if you start focusing on, okay, as opposed to focusing on money, focus exactly on the project, the idea. What value can you, can you extract out of it? If you build up your, your project to reach a certain level of value and you find any one of us exactly and say, you know what, this is what I've got to do and I'm looking for 100,000 Rand. If I see my interest in that, in a way that I could give you the 100,000 Rand for me to get great returns in a short period of time or in about a, year, a year's time, trust me, the only thing we've done is exchanging value. I've, I've given you 100,000 Rand worth of your project's value. It's just a value exchange. So if you think that money is a problem, then it's more about your project or idea that is a problem than the money is. Because the money is all around you guys. Your uncle has got the money. Your brother's got the money. Your teacher has got access to the money. Everybody around you has got money. Think about it this way. If a good friend of yours takes you all the time to go out there and drink and splash his bottles of champagne every single weekend and every single night. Start thinking. Start thinking exactly how this guy can spend on you as opposed to spending money on a bottle of champagne. Think about it this way. This is, this is a joking way for me to do this, but I could say to this person, you know what? I've got a beautiful project that if you invest in me right now, you'll make so much returns in a short period of time that you could buy whatever number of bottles of champagne you want every single weekend. If this guy sees in return that there's value for him to continue buying those bottles of champagne, all right, in six months or so, because he can invest 50 grand or 100 grand on your idea, as long as you deliver, he not only will be so happy, but he could potentially open the doors for multiple other capital rates. So money for me is just an idea that if, if, if we were to focus in building that particular idea and give it a certain value, you'll be able to raise as much money as you can for you to be able to build your POCs. Right, right, right. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's about thinking, right? Think, think, think. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I would say. I mean, you know, the amount, the value that you get from spending time thinking, far outweighs the time and the value that you get sometimes from running around and trying to get something done that fails a month later, two months later, or, you know, because 
You see, when you spend time thinking, you're able to understand the A to Z of whatever it is that you're doing and be able to actually uh, uh, see the corners that, and, and, and all the challenges that, that exist, you know, and also come up with different ways of doing things. I mean, one of the things for me, I believe, is that, you know, any industry can be challenged. Any corporate company can be challenged and you can become number one. I don't care what, what company it is. My belief is you can go in there, do the same thing better, more efficient, with a, you know cost effective, and in, in a way that you deliver the same service to 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 the to the client. You need is a boss. You know I, you know you literally have to you know pick a telephone book and put your finger. And I can bet you, you can do whatever that company that your finger goes on, you can do whatever they're doing better and in a much more innovative way and achieve and achieve better results. So, so, and I think that's the mindset that we need going forward into the future. You know, it's, we don't need a defeated mindset. You know, we don't need a mindset as entrepreneurs that says, you know what, this coronavirus has affected me. I've lost money. I've so on. But how can you bounce back? You know, because one thing that, Every business, every customer of yours or client is looking for, they're looking for value. They're looking to make more money. So how do you position yourself so that, you know, you could help them achieve their goal and in the same, at the same time, achieving your own goal, you know? So, yeah, yeah. Vusi, are you, are you there? Do you, do you want to comment there on that? I'm, I'm here, here very much. Of, yeah. yeah, I'm here. Yeah, we, we, I'm, we, uh, yeah. Now I want I wanted to say that um, we're gonna wrap up in about in about five ten minutes. So yeah, yeah. Carry I, on. I wanted to you. say that I think the most important thing for everybody in this webinar to remember is that business, it, at its purest form, is a form of value exchange, which means it should be a force for good. Right. Um, right. And. It actually just doesn't matter the stage of business you're at. At the end of the day, what you're trying to do is to make sure that you're creating value and in exchange, the market rewards you for the value that you're creating. It's, it's not complex. The mechanism that we use to construct it, of course, is complex. The way we institutionalize that mechanism, yes, complex, but the idea itself is very simple. I mentioned this because I think it's important for everybody in the conversation, in particular the entrepreneurs, and I was just reading the, the comments in the Q&A, that's why I went quiet. But I think it's important for everybody in the conversation, especially the entrepreneurs, to start the conversation at the point of value. So, uh, you know, I notice a lot of comments where people are talking at the point of product, or at the point of the market, or start at the point of value. That is, you know, what's your hypothesis? What's the issue that you're solving? Why is that issue important? And how are you making, and how is you solving that issue a part of a decent value exchange for the world? Once that's clear at a macro level, the micros tend to take care of themselves. And, you know, we started this at a micro level, right. build a decent management team, make sure that you raise funding that's affordable, get your packaging right, your product right, your pricing right, get your ecosystem right, get your distribution right, get your corporate governance right, all of that stuff. That's micro, but at a macro level, if the value exchange is not right, then you can get the micro details right. You're not going to have, you're not going to run away anyway. And I think it's important for the entrepreneurs right. in this conversation, maybe just to take a step back as you get back into your own business, just to assess whether or not you've come at it with the right macro assumptions and the right macro assessment. Right, right. That's fantastic. That, that's brilliant, you know, and, um, and, and, and really, you've just summarized it, Bussi. That's, that's, that's brilliant. I mean, at its fundamental level, business is about value exchange, you know, and, and, and people buy into value. And, and, and you know, so, so I think that's the question that entrepreneurs have got to, uh, uh, you know, leave this, this uh, program with. What value am I offering to the market, you know? And, and depending on the, on the level of value, it's, you're going to get paid for, for that level of value, you know. Uh, and until you, you polish it up and bring it to a certain stage, you know, 
there's companies that have been paid literally billions of, of rands or dollars, um, you know, just before they even they even take off. But it's about the value that's perceived and how they right. patent their idea, you know, before they take it to market. So, you know, value comes in different forms and you've you got to assess that and see, you know, what value am I, am I offering to the market? So that, that's brilliant. You know, we've got a couple of questions here and I know we've been... Uh, just answering a lot of them as we as you as we go. I mean, there's one uh, question here. Do you think property is good investment? You know, I don't know if anybody wants to answer that one. Is that right? Do you think property is a good investment? <laughs> Someone wants to invest in property. In cup properties. Wrong, wrong webinar. Company. Wrong webinar. <laughs> <laughs> wrong webinar. Yeah. <laughs> Sir, yeah. sir Walter, is that, is, that property, is that property or is it company? So property as in real estate? Yes. Depen depends on the I location, the really location, the location. Well, look, I, uh, I, uh, <laughs> a terrible question. I'll, 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 terrible I'll mention a few things on that. I'll mention a few things on that. And I'll, and I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you my interest on, on, on that particularly. Um, the beauty of what I do on the blockchain space is that I can structure any transaction in any industry right now, as, as long as there's value exchange, as long as it makes sense to, my, uh, to, to, to the SPV that we're putting together. I, I can put together an SPV uh, fund and, and fuel it up with our blockchain platform for us to be able to uh, venture in these particular ind industries. I'll, I'll tell you exactly the five key areas that I'm personally very much interested in. So there's agriculture, there's healthcare and insurance, there's fintech and banking, there's mining, and there's real estate. So with the question to the real estate aspect, it is an interesting, an interesting space. There's obviously the, the retail sector, your, your estates and, and, and all, the, all these kind of uh, uh, property development, but there's also commercial. And we all can agree that the commercial sector in the real estate has been really, really badly affected right now. It, it could possibly be the wrong space for you to venture in and, and throw in your capital. But um, people will still need to leave in certain places. So the retail space when it comes to real estate is definitely important. But here's the problem. For a very long time, let me take, for example, South Africa. We know that the real estate property development era has been tremendously dominated before the apartheid era by, by the, white, the white folks, right? So many of the, 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 the post-apartheid section has been not, not privileged for them to be able to get into this particular space. And it could seem to be extremely hard and challenging for a young black man to position themselves when it comes to real estate investing or property development, right? So this is what we are doing in this particular space. We're leveraging the blockchain technology for us to give an opportunity to anybody, of course, within certain, certain rules, um, that will become an investor into a real estate property and so forth. So I've got uh, some actually two, two, two entrepreneurs in South Africa reaching out to me, as well as a project that I'm actually currently kicking in in Ghana uh, right now. And I don't know if my, my, you know, this gentleman is currently on this webinar. Benjamin. So what, what are we doing? So we are structuring a fund, allowing us to engage with a property developer who's gotten authorization from the government to be able to build multiple units over the next 10 years, right? But instead of leaving that as an opportunity for investment to only the big pockets, we are, uh, you know, stretching that along and giving an opportunity to anybody, in fact, even any one of the attendees, to become an investor in this particular space. But how would you become an investor in this space? We are creating a parallel economy, stimulating a digital economy, using blockchain, te blockchain technology and digital asset. By doing what? By creating tokens that can allow somebody to become an investor within certain, uh, uh, of course, abiding to certain laws within certain jurisdiction, if you have to invest in in Ghana or in Nigeria and so forth. But the beauty as well with the blockchain space is that we breaking barriers that previously prevented 
the unprivileged to become co-investor as part of a specific project, right? So not only are we lower, lowering the barriers of entry, but we're also allowing you to do cross-border investment. So somebody in South Africa can invest on a really lucrative real estate project as part of our infrastructure in Ghana. Somebody in Nigeria or somebody in California, by the way, could invest on a project, on a real estate project in Eastern Cape in South Africa. But then, of course, when it comes to investing, it's about what good are we doing, but also what revenue can, can we actually project we are going to make in the future. But again, that's, that could be a, an explanation for, for another webinar, uh, not, on, not specifically on this one, but we are enabling platforms. We are enabling these guys to become participants. And, and, and in fact, somebody reached out to me, uh, I believe he's from Soweto, and he reached out to me and said, hey, John, you know what, have you heard about the the how tank uh, um, I can't remember what that was, but there is there is an initiative to be able to fund uh, SMEs in the rural areas, in the townships. Uh, put together what they call a so-called exchange uh, 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 to stimulate the economy in a, in a in a rural area. So they thought of bringing together an OTC platform, uh, which is over the trading uh, uh, oh, yeah. counter platform that would allow these fo these folks to be able to engage. And he reached out to me and said, "Listen." We've got all of that already set up because uh, my company, CryptoVex Capital Custody, have got not only the this structure, the blockchain platform, uh, we've got the custody in terms of the, all the licenses. We can do transaction fiat and, 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 and crypto and all that kind of stuff and allowing us to put together multiple different vehicles in different verticals and in different regions, allowing folks to become investors uh, as part of that particular uh, uh, project or whatever that is. So. We are enabling and creating, stimulating an economy parallel to what the government is doing and what uh, entrepreneurs or business folks are, or venture capital firms in traditional sense are currently doing. And that's why I love this particular space, enabling that. Right. And in fact, that's the reason, one of the reasons why the blockchain was created, really, to be able to regain and, 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 and give power back right. to the people. But unless you understand that, you wouldn't be able to, uh, to participate. You might be like oh. Jeff, who is very conservative so far, uh, from a blockchain perspective <laughs> yeah yeah i think i think the short answer to to that what what john is saying is there's there is an opportunity here to invest in property but you gotta speak to john i think and get in touch with him to understand more about how to do it uh, via the, the the channel and the method that he's uh he's busy with over there so so that's um yeah i think there's one more question uh you know uh, that that i'd like to see if we can uh, each get an answer to and then and then we're going to wrap up uh you know this is from landy lenkiza he says would a value proposition be suitable enough to get funding and i guess what he's saying there is that you know i'm in a position where I may not have the money to put together the business plan and all of that and come to you with something that's substantial in terms of, but I've got a brilliant idea, you know, just a value proposition, you know. Can I come to a venture capital company and sit there and say, you know what, i got this idea to build a Facebook. Is that enough? Uh, is that enough trust funding, you know? Um, yeah. Anybody? Jeff? Sure, I'll uh, take that one. Uh, generally speaking, no, that's not enough to attract funding. <laughs> Just having right. an idea, lots of people have ideas. Uh, but yeah. what, what institutional capital is gonna wanna see before it will invest is that the idea has actually been brought to fruition in some form or fashion. It doesn't have to be fully baked, but it has to be having some success in some market traction, okay. some proof of demand, you know, Absolutely. there has to be more than just an idea. Uh, when, when people come to me with an idea and say, hey, what should I do with venture capital? I said, look, call your rich uncle, call your cousins, call your mama, <laughs> call people that know you and will write a check to help you get your little business off the ground and figure out how to do things without money. Figure out how to get people. You know, if John wants to start a new business, he needs to convince Lucy and Jeff and Walter to work on their spare time on the weekends to help him get his business moving and to help get some meetings and to help get some discussions, help prove there's demand and, you know, and, and to get the business moving. 
do everything you can before you go raise money. <laughs> you have to be, I think we somebody said it earlier, you have to be ready to take money before you go raise money. Uh, you have to know what you're right. going to do with it. How many people are you going to hire? Where are you going to go build? What market are you going to go after? And you have to, you can't, you can't just take money and be chasing a dream. You actually have to lay out the plan of how you're going to achieve your dream before you take money. Right. So there's, right. there's a lot there. There's a lot too that I didn't say. There's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than I just made it seem. But uh, uh, yeah. don't, don't yeah. just raise money because you have an idea. Don't try to. You'll be disappointed. You're right. You're yeah, right. can I jump in on this? Can yeah. I just say yeah. something on this? Yeah, go I ahead. Feel, I feel very strongly about this. So to the person who just asked the question about ideas, let's think this through logically. What are the odds that I have ideas too? Yeah. And, and so why would I take my money that I've taken the risk to accumulate and have the responsibility to preserve and give it to you, a perfect stranger, on your ideas? I mean, what, what, uh, it's this test. This is just a logical, this is a reasonable man's test. Why would I take what I've taken, you know, two decades to accumulate and give it to you? What is it about you that makes you so amazing that I would just give you my money at, at, at an idea or at a whim? And if the answer is I wouldn't, well, let's extend that. So we are an institutional investor. We invest alongside our clients which means I have the responsibility to be judicious with the capital I invest. So what are the odds that I'm going to take my clients' money and give it to you on your idea if I wouldn't take my own money and do it? I really think for entrepreneurs who come at this with an idea stage, I'm gonna say something that's gonna sound terrible, but it's true. Um, you, you need to sink into the world of reality. And the world of reality, is based on an environment where you understand how the world works. So before you go into the world and go, I have an idea, please fund me for this idea. You've got to make sure you've got decent proof of concept. You've made some decent traction. You've got a POC, you've got an MVP, you've got decent runway, something an investor can look at and go, I get it. This is specifically true, by the way, Dr. Walter, for the entrepreneurs in this, con in this conversation who are based in Africa. Let me make this real for you. In the world's yeah. largest capital market system, right. the US, with the world's most advanced technology ecosystem in the US, not even Mark Zuckerberg could raise with an idea. Yeah. He needed a minimum viable product. So what do you think right. are the odds right. that in the world's darkest continent, with the issues we have, someone's just gonna give you money with, the, with an idea. I think it's really important that entrepreneurs and founders come at this with a semblance of reality. Yeah, and let's make this, let's take it a step further, Vusi, and make it real. What did Mark Zuckerberg do? He built a system. Exactly. So that started yeah. getting students to right. use it. Students exactly. all around America, right. not just at Harvard where he built the system, Students at colleges all around America started using this thing, and it was called the Facebook back then. <laughs> and right, it was, it was right. a long time before he took institutional money, a long time, because right. he developed it and right. he baked it and, it, and it became something much bigger than he originally envisioned. His original vision is he just wanted to meet girls. That what a way to start a business. <laughs> I've got to go, Walter. It's been great. I think, I think, right. All right. No, I think, I think we we've done. We, we, we pretty much done. Thanks, thanks, gentlemen. And, and I mean, those are great uh, ending remarks right there. I mean, you know, that's why it's not for everybody, you know. I mean, you, you really got to see, check first if you cut out for this. Because, you know, the reality is it's not a walk in the park, you know. And you got to get ready because it's not... It's not as easy as it sounds. There's got to be some sweat that's going to go, go in it. So I think, gentlemen, thank you so much. And, you thank know, we've you got Farai Gundan joining us. She's a Forbes editor. She's a, a fellow at Harvard. Yeah. She's coming in on, on the 7th. So, you know, we're going to be putting out posters for that. Busi, thank you, man. You've been amazing, incredible. And, you know, if we could have you again, I will reach out to you and see if you can still empower us, John, are you, you're just amazing, man. That crypto 
space and you do just hogging it, you know. So we need to learn a lot more about that. So, yeah, guys, have a good bro. one. And uh, chat to you on the next one. All right. Lucy, I'll reach out to you this week. Let's do, let's do a repeat of our meeting. <laughs> yeah. All right, cheers. All right. Thank All you. All right, cheers, 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 cheers. Bye.